Good morning or good afternoon to all. Welcome for most of you. Welcome back. So you are starting now the session number two, the, the day two. The the we'll start as the, according to the program to the keynote. But before the keynote session, the coordinator of the working group eight, Professor Mario De Stefan, would like to say a few words. Please, Mario. Yes. So um, thanks, uh, Rita. Uh, just a few words. This is a, for me an occasion also to uh, thank both uh, uh, keynote lecturers for uh, their uh, very valuable contribution to our uh, workshop. I also think that uh, we should start uh, uh, congratulating uh, Rita for uh, the excellent uh, work. Uh, uh, she and uh, her uh, and members of the um, organizing committee are doing. And uh, the reason why we, it's good that we start congratulating her, I, there is one more reason, let's say, of course, this acknowledgement of the excellent work, but there's one more reason that we will talk about during the uh, closing uh, session. So I wanted just to urge you to participate to the of course, to all sessions and to the closing session too is important. Uh, we will have a final discussion that will be also important for organizational uh, reasons. And uh, there will be some invited remarks, but I uh, uh, expect all of you to participate and to give your remarks during this uh, closing session. So I want, that's my uh, advice and uh, I hope that uh, all of us will gather at the end and uh, we will uh, have this final discussion that uh, uh, will uh, be the closing uh, session, will be the closing session. Okay, so thanks for uh, attention and uh, okay, so Rita, you can continue. Okay. So formally, we'll start now the keynote session. So it's my honor to introduce today's keynote speaker, Associate Professor at the Sturtle Engineering at the Department of Civil Engineering and Architecture of the University of Pavia since 2015. He is recognized with the scientific community, uh, com community by his sustained and excellent contributions in the field of seismic vulnerability of existing masonry structures and heritage buildings, and numerical modeling of the seismic structural response. He has carried out research activities characterized by significant experimental campaigns on the in and out of plane response of masonry field walls in reinforced concrete structures, in plain cycle response of full-scale masonry peers, effectiveness of different strength solution and shaking table testing masonry buildings. So today our guest will sharing with us topics related to the seismic response of masonry buildings aggregates in historical centers, complex and highly irregular in plan and elevation systems. So this presentation will certainly also reflect his personal experience in participating in post earthquake field missions, survey activities in Italy and other old countries, and his involvement in different association and working groups in the field. So we are looking forward to this. Let's welcome Professor Andrea Pena. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Rita. Thank you. Uh, I thank the all the organization uh, and all the, uh, the colleagues and, and friends who are there who are attending this uh, important workshop. And in um, I try to share my screen. Okay, fine. Uh, the topic of uh, my presentation today is about uh, say building aggregates in historic centers, which uh, I, I think they perfectly match the, the, the topics uh, we, you are dealing in this important working group of the European Association of Electrical Engineering, because you are the, we are dealing the, with the seismic behavior of buildings or say structures, which are certainly irregular and complex. 
uh, you, in this topic, I will talk about some of the uh, observed seismic behavior. What do we have understood about the seismic behavior of these buildings uh, from uh, observations, from tests, and from analysis? But we are still, uh, say, not so close to the a full understanding of these of the behavior of these uh, very complex structures. But we are, they, I think that the research on these uh, should continue and uh, take advantage of all the available uh, uh, advancement that have been done in, uh, in these years, in the last years at least. Uh, building aggregates are certainly a distinctive feature of European cities. Uh, not only European, but uh, in particular in historic centers of uh, European cities, we have uh, different uh, examples of uh, uh, measuring building uh, aggregates. Uh, we see from uh, these uh, slides uh, that these structures uh, are complex and these building conglomeration have been uh, evolving. Uh, in time due to transformations uh, and uh, we can now classify them as uh, different types of, uh, of structures including presence of courtyards or uh, row aggregates or other shapes of uh, these aggregates. The irregularity is the main characteristic of these uh, uh, conglomerations. So we have different number of stories different height of the interstories, which result in misalignment of floors uh, between adjacent buildings. We have, uh, uh, in many cases, uh, these buildings which uh, somehow follow the, um, the hill slopes, so they, are, they can be uh, oriented in a different way, depending also on the orography of the, um, of the sites where they are built. Uh, there are irregularities in structural details, which actually affect significantly the, uh, the response of these, uh, of these structures. For instance, in, uh, in, in, the, in the connection between the different structural units, which can be really poor or, or absent. Uh, these are some examples of these, which actually in many cases results from building in different uh, ages, different times, different periods, and transformations uh, due to many factors, including natural hazards and man-made hazards as well. So when we deal with an existing uh, ag building aggregate, uh, we have to carry out a critical survey to identify uh, the type of flow diaphragms, the type of measuring, uh, and this helps in identifying also the uh, original structure and its transformation along time. You can see from these uh, drawings some of these uh, exercises that have been done by some colleagues, several of them are Italian, but there are also colleagues working on this topic uh, in many countries, including Portugal, of course. Uh, But what do we know about the seismic behavior of these structures? We know stories of uh, failure, a lot of them. We, we also have good news. We, we got good news from, for instance, from the Central Italy earthquake, what concerns the city of Norcia. But Norcia is, very, is a very particular case in which we have the, say, stratification of intervention that uh, over time uh, allowed to protect at least ordinary buildings, not for the, uh, unfortunately churches and mon monuments uh, were not part of these, uh, um, these advances, but in uh, what you we observe in the, in the other historic centers in the, in, uh, in the region, for instance, this is Viso, which is uh, a few kilometers from Norcia. We see, even if we have systematic presence of tie roads, we have a lot of damages due to out of plane collapses and interaction uh, of different uh, adjacent buildings with different dynamic characteristics and different structural characteristics. 
this is not only a let's say a Italian and European problem we see all these pictures from other world countries we have uh, uh, New, New Zealand we have these pictures from the US very old actually and uh, the uh, this this other one from Chile in 2010 in all these cases we have building aggregates and we have damage in many cases it is out of plane which is actually a non-distinctive uh, characteristic of the aggregates because we can have this kind of, of damage also in uh, uh, in ordinary buildings uh, or isolated buildings but in some case in, in there are some cases in which uh, possibly aggregates favor these mechanisms as well. Uh, and looking at those observations uh, can be done also in a say more uh, organized and systematic way. So what we did uh, together with Annalisa Rosti and uh, Maria Rota was to work on the, the large and complete data set of the L'Aquila event, the post earthquake survey forms, which allow the collection of damage. And among the information that we collect in with using this, uh, um, this form, uh, this is also the position of the building within the aggregate. So we could uh, differentiate the uh, response of um, measuring structures if they are isolated, if they are uh, in, a, in an aggregate, and uh, if they are corner, uh, extreme, or internal units of the aggregate. I would have expected a, a certain outcome, but it was not like that. This is the uh, result of this regression used um, starting from the empirical data. And uh, you can see that basically no influence of the position can be uh, noticed. But there is a significant difference in between buildings that belong to an aggregate and isolated buildings. Basically, the fragility, say the vulnerability of these uh, um, of the um, building in uh, in aggregate is higher than the building which is isolated, which is this is not intuitive, or it is if we consider that the reason for this can be the structural irregularity that we can find normally in a building aggregate. So we can uh, derive fragility curves for aggregate versus isolated buildings. And we see that, that systematically, we notice a higher vulnerability in uh, aggregate buildings, uh, independently that we have a uh, irregular layout or poor quality measuring, typically undressed or rubble stone measuring, and or regular or good layout quality measuring, which means uh, uh, brick and block uh, measuring normally. Uh, and independently on the height of the buildings, because we have we notice the same uh, trend if we consider low rise, so one two story, or mid to high rise buildings, we have the same uh, trend. So as we were saying before, the difference then the of the behavior has to be the role of structural irregularities that we can find in uh, building aggregates. And if we start performing some analysis, we can notice that the presence of an adjacent building changes a lot the response of, a, of our building. And this interaction, the pounding that, and the damage concentration we can have at the uh, interface between the, the the different buildings is certainly one of the reasons for uh, this kind of, uh, say in general, negative behavior. Uh, you can see some pictures of uh, this is L'Aquila, uh, the historic center of L'Aquila. We could notice systematically this kind of uh, damages, compounding, misalignment of floors, uh, pounding of building with different dynamic behavior. And also damage concentration at upper, at upper stories where we have a, a 
sudden uh, difference in uh, stiffness and, and masses. And this is again central Italy, again this so with the, some of the damages that we could see also before. There are also cases where connections are uh, say designed properly, and this is an example from um, there are also, there are both pictures from Central Italy as well from the same uh, event. But in some cases, you can see on the on the left that the connection of the building, which was built in the second stage, was prepared or was organized by adding uh, this uh, by adding these uh, stones that cross the, the joint in between the, the building and these stones can be found in some cases already at the beginning uh, at the construction uh, of the, uh, the original construction of the building so uh, in some somehow this building is prepared to be connected and to be to become part of an aggregate in a second stage this was probably an attempt that uh, was also tempted in this case uh, of this uh, uh, building uh, which was damaged from the emilia earthquake but the problem was that the, the, the this connection was not that effective and uh, we could notice this case is this is Cavezzo from um, the uh, middle epoch uh, this event had two main um, this this earthquake had two main events one on May 20 and the other on May 29 and the two epicenter was relatively close to each other the result is that the damage activated was then uh, a collapse in, uh, in the in the neighbor unit with limited damage to the, the original part of the structure. So, of course, we have uh, vulnerability to local out of plane failure modes in this kind of uh, of buildings, and this is recognized also by by the code, uh, the Italian code provides some, uh, say, guidelines for the assessment of global response of building conglomerations. Uh, although in some aspects it is really, say, bug, say that it is recommended to use appro appropriate modeling and verification criteria. It is then suggested to uh, identify a, a structural unit as a preliminary step. And then, which is probably some, sometimes not that easy to do, uh, and then the code also suggests that uh, when once you, we have these uh, uh, structural uh, units, uh, then we can uh, try to evaluate the effects of the trust and, um, and other loads uh, and uh, relevant masses that are acting on these uh, unit from the uh, adhesion to units. This is, in many cases, impossible because when you are working on a single building, on a single sexual unit, it is quite complex and sometimes impractical to investigate what happens in the neighbor unit. You, in, in many practical cases, you cannot even, even enter the, the neighbor units. But then, okay, uh, what we can try to consider is the effect of the geometry or the misalignments of the uh, elements uh, to highlight the possibility that um, we could notice some specific local mechanism or local failures due to the interaction uh, with, the, um, with the neighbor uh, unit. And then the code prescribes a minimum, a global analysis of a single unit, even neglecting the, um, uh, the interaction with the adhesion to others. It is a preliminary stage and it 
it is uh, clearly that this is a uh, uh, say a conventional way of of taking the the problem. Uh, also because the use of very simplified methods and models is allowed to do to do this. But uh, when we try to to check what happens if we analyze a single unit in a, in an aggregate, then we can. Uh, we, we came to, to these uh, uh, results. So if we, uh, for instance, uh, analyze uh, a very regular aggregate like this one with uh, say three, five or nine uh, units, and we look, for instance, at the in-plane distortion of laws, we notice that obviously in the end units, we get higher distortion. But if we compare it with the results we got, we get from for the for the single cell for the single unit, this is not always same representative. And in particular, we can notice that in a, depending on the direction of the analysis, the, the response of the single unit can be very conservative or really unconservative. So we, in this case, we try to suggest the use of a sort of effective unit modeling in the presence of the very flexible diaphragms in this case, um, modeling the external wall and the internal wall of the of the of the cell. Uh, the internal is the, the wall in contact with the adjacent uh, buildings and the external is the the uh, the head wall of the of the row. And in this case for what concerns the transverse direction we get very similar thick uh, distortion. But this is a, say, quite a simplified uh, thing, but uh, at least can be uh, a possibility. Then in this uh, other analysis, we have modeled uh, a linear conglomeration and we have tried to address this issue in a different way. And considering what would an engineer uh, do when dealing with this high distortion, uh, would possibly try to strengthen the building, to uh, retrofit the buildings by stiffening the floors. And if he's operating on a single unit only, the result could be something like this. So significantly improvement and uh, significant improved behavior of this uh, end unit not as much as if, if we are considering the uh, the unit as isolated but then the the problem moves to the to the next one and probably this is not a good uh, a good idea it is completely different if we consider a uniform retrofit intervention. In this case, we, depending on the degree of stiffness we are adding to the um, to our diaphragms, we can move to a, from a very flexible response to a nearly rigid response, which is not always a good uh, solution as well, because we will know that caution and response then become uh, an issue. But in general. This kind of intervention is at least more uh, provides more uh, say, uh, controlled outcome. So I basically already uh, commented this uh, this point. From the modeling uh, viewpoint, we can discuss about the use of pushover analysis. In some cases, this kind of analysis is uh, okay. We, we all know that in practice, for this, in particular for the assessment of uh, existing measure buildings, this is the say uh, the main method that we use for uh, for assessing existing structures. But in the case of very irregular and complex buildings, it is not given uh, for granted that uh, this is the the right way to proceed. In the case of very flexible diaphragms, then we can extract uh, single buildings, possibly considering uh, uh, 
tributary masses uh, and loads submitted from uh, um, from uh, radiation diaphragms and radiation walls, possibly including in the model also um, parts or portions of the transverse walls as as flanges that uh, we can analyze uh, together with the, the wall under consideration to say, represent the, the behavior. This is somehow the, the best uh, situation from the analysis uh, viewpoint, because in, uh, in a case like this, uh, there is a, somehow a little influence of the fact that this, this wall is included in a very complex structure, because we assume that the collaboration of the different walls is quite limited. But if we have a building like this, this is a real case, this is an hospital, uh, and you have to analyze this portion of the building, uh, then uh, if floors are sufficiently stiff, and this was the case, uh, you need to, to either perform a complete survey and then a complete model, or to try to to, um, to identify possible simplifications in 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 your analysis, and this depends on many many factors, including uh, the uh, the type of connection that uh, we have in between the two buildings. And in this case, there was a sort of dry joint, so we could uh, model the interaction by means of no tension trusses. Uh, and consider the, uh, the main building as stiff enough to, to be represented as a, as a restraint. In, if it is not the case, you can also consider some stiffness, uh, some flexibility. For instance, you can model this, um, this restraint, this, uh, the presence of the, the building as a, as a stiff building. And this is a, uh, what we got. So in uh, some directions, when you go parallel or you, you, you are going uh, far from the, the joint, you basically do not uh, include the effect of the other building. But you, you, when you go towards the, uh, the other building, which act as a restraint, the presence of the building is basically inducing a torsional response, a significant torsional response in the in this uh, part of the building under, under investigation. And understanding this helps in designing it properly a strengthening intervention, for instance. For instance, in this wall where a uh, significant demand is expected. This is another recent uh, um, attempt of uh, taking this, uh, this issue. This was done uh, within a um, Central uh, Lewis project by the group of uh, Professor Lago Marcino and co-workers. And this is, uh, the idea is to study the vulnerability of uh, building A, so the corner building in this, uh, in this aggregate, considering the fact that building is actually included in a, in a building aggregate uh, and there are two neighbor structures they named in this case, building B and building C. And the modeling of these connections is basically the key aspect of this, of this work. And you can see that depending on the choices, you can get a completely different behavior. So you can have a, a modeling as radiation building, so they can only exchange normal forces through uh, trusses or, or no tension trusses, or you can model uh, considering also the presence of a sort of uh, um, capping elements that uh, um, do not allow um, transverse uh, relative uh, displacement, or you can model the buildings as fully connected. The three results are, um, have been uh, explored. And in this case, also combining the effect of uh, local out-of-plane uh, mechanisms, the, the outcome is that the final fragility is quite similar 
in the in the different cases but in this case you can notice that there are no irregularities in elevation which is an important aspect to to consider so okay we, we have seen a lot from uh, and learned a lot from uh, models and analysis but then we finally had the opportunity of performing some tests and this uh, this test was uh, funded by uh, some uh, Swiss institutions uh, because they were interested in understanding what happens or what would happen in in the historic center of the city of Basel in case of a repetition of, of the destructive earthquake of uh, 1356 uh, and this uh, was uh, what we tried to to consider in using uh, these uh, half scale uh, stone measure specimen, uh, which was built in uh, on the U center shaking table. Uh, this project was done uh, obviously in collaboration with the PFL and the group of uh, Catherine Bayer. And in this case, we try to consider some degree of connection, some. Uh, so the, the buildings are adjacent, one wall is built before the other, and some stones is left in this case to, to allow a, a limited degree of connection. Uh, the irregularity in height is not uh, that uh, uh, pronounced. It is mainly due to the different um, height of the roofs, which is made of these uh, trusses. It is reproducing actually the the, the actual system that uh, we can uh, find in uh, in the real buildings, which has some degree of of uh, um, of stiffness provided by this truss, uh, this brace. So uh, this is the uh, these are the details, and then you can see here in this test what happened before the activation of some retrofit measures can see these cracks along this line, which is actually identifying the activation of uh, mechanisms uh, of the overturning of this part of this, uh, on the, what you call south facade and the uh, and portions of the, of the, of the uh, walls uh, aligned with the uh, shaking direction, which is actually, in the, the, sh the shaking table is uniaxial and this is the, shaking direction. We then activated these uh, um, uh, improved connections, uh, wall to diaphragm connection like this, and uh, uh, in a second stage, uh, in a, say third stage in this case, in the second uh, retrofit stage, we also activated uh, these uh, tie rods at each floor levels in each direction. And the um, in this uh, post tensioning of these tie rods provides a, a significant improvement in the behavior. Even if you can see from this comparison that uh, the hysterectic response of the buildings prior to the intervention, so when we got damaged and after connection and after the uh, activation of tie rods is not that different in terms of general um, hysterectic behavior despite say damages accumulating and uh, you can see from these uh, representations uh, which uh, this plot of angular deformation of different parts of the uh, of the building that actually the effect of tie rods is pronounced in particular on the residual cracks that we notice after the test which is basically near to zero and this also applies to the gap opening in between the two units. Uh, and you see that there is a residual gap uh, of uh, up to height millimeter, eight millimeters on, on top uh, in between the two units, which goes basically to zero after the uh, retrofit interventions. And this is the the final stage of the test after the intervention at, at a certain time we decided that the, the, the building was strong, strong enough and we had to stop the test um, 
because actually it was uh, uh, in this case okay damage was uh, uh, spread over all the elements measure peers who aligned with the shaking direction who were mainly involved in uh, in rocking motion so we could continue a lot but then we decided it was enough and the, the winner was the blue Then we tried to simulate numerically because the, one of the main goals of the, this project was to develop numerical models uh, capable of uh, reproducing the behavior of this kind of, of structure. This is a very interesting work carried out by Francesco Vanin at EP, EPFL um, using OpenSeas. And this is, uh, say, the dual. Uh, Activity we did uh, using uh, Tremuri, which we had to say use some tricks to uh, account also for the out of plane response, in particular relevant for the gable walls and the, um, the roof structure. Even in this, in this case, the response was um, was well captured. Uh, the damage uh, diffusion is uh, reasonably matching the. And the observed ones, and also we could uh, say try to exploit the exper these experimental results, moving from the, uh, the half scale model to, to a full scale model, and then to extend the, the full scale model, adding buildings in a in a row, uh, including both uh, the idea of strong connections as say relatively strong connection as they were in the real building, and then try to simulate the presence of the uh, dry connections, so very weak connection in between the, the, the different units. And in this case, we could say simulate damage, the uh, propagation, and also uh, the uh, opening of gaps, the different uh, locations. And you can see that the higher, uh, the highest gaps are again in between the different the, the units with the very different uh, uh, structural behavior, the tall units and the, and the low, the low and the short one. And also, in terms of damage diffusion, you see that the the presence of weak connections is uh, uh, significantly affecting also the spread of damage uh, among the different structural elements in the two facades. And this is the very recent uh, test. Uh, this was. Uh, actually completed a few days ago uh, in, uh, in Lisbon. Uh, this is part of the, um, the CERA um, project funded by the European Commission. And you can consider as an extension somehow of the Basel uh, test because we try to use the same type of measure, the same characteristics. Uh, the, the specimen is again half scale. Uh, but in this case, we explicitly try to model dry connections and uh, systematic uh, and mark uh, difference in I to provide different dynamic behavior of the two units. And there was a blind prediction with a lot of participants, possibly some of the, you know, the people attending here uh, also participated to this, uh, this blind prediction. And all the results experimental results and uh, the band prediction will be published in uh, an upcoming uh, special issue of the Bulletin of Vertical Engineering. And just to give you a preview of what actually happened during the test, I can show you the video of the key uh, run of these uh, tests. You can see the gap which is already open here. The opening closes. There's the pounding, and there is basically the damage concentration in this upper part. Say as expected, as as realistically would happen in a real in a real case. And, and this damage condition is actually similar to many of the cases, the real cases we have seen in a, in case of post-epic observation. So this is another uh, shaking table test. 
uh, on a completely different case. This is uh, the end unit of uh, Terra's house, which is a, um, a typical Dutch construction. Uh, we did this test because of, you know, maybe know the, the problem of the induced mist in the northern uh, Netherlands. And uh, this is a cavity wall construction, uh, but in a, to some, it is somehow representative of, of this building, which could be considered as a very simple building aggregate. In this case, the building aggregate is not irregular, is relatively regular. And uh, this is the result of the um, experimental uh, testing with the uh, cracks uh, spread in the inner leaf and the outer veneer of the of this uh, of this building and then we try to again simulate the um, the uh, numerical numerically the response observed in uh, in the test for this uh, let's say substructure of the, this portion of the of the terrace house, we were say, relatively satisfied about the capacity of the model in predicting the um, the nonlinear response of the um, of the building, in both in terms of uh, hysteretic behavior and in terms of damage diffusion. And then we try to move from the single end unit again to extend it to the entire uh, building aggregate so in the to the entire terrace uh, house which is basically uh, obtained by the repetition of the uh, of the end unit which is modeled then in a parametric study we try to to study the effect of the enlargement in the transverse direction or um, to by adding uh, one story so in, to increase the height of the, of these buildings but in particular, if we look at these uh, results, which are um, results of, shake, uh, of um, incremental dynamic analysis, uh, and then um, uh, processed to derive fragility functions, we can notice that in this case, the presence of uh, a single unit is, uh, uh, the, the, the model with a single unit is more vulnerable than the one slightly more vulnerable than the one of the uh, of the terrace house because in this case we can notice that the regularity of the of the structure provides some collaboration uh, among the different units and um, in this case the, the the vulnerability seems to be slightly reduced so in conclusion because i i have to thank you also for your patience and for, for listening till this uh, this point uh, the vulnerability of uh, building conglomerations of uh, measly structures is significantly high, and this is uh, high because of okay. We start from a vulnerable structure, which is the measly building, and then we are complicating the situation by uh, adding irregularity in plan elevation and in construction. Many uh, construction irregularities can be found in, in building aggregates. Uh, we, we could see uh, that structural assessment of uh, um, unenforced uh, uh, measure building aggregate is inherently complex. And we try to use the information which is, can be gathered from available shaking table test uh, and uh, available numerical models to obtain a, a say additional information to to provide to, to provide uh, as a final goal to provide practitioners to uh, with the uh, uh, say uh, guidelines or uh, say simplified methods if we will be able to to to, to get in a, in the future to better understand what is the expected behavior of, of, a, of a building aggregate. So these parametric studies are definitely needed to, to guide the everyday assessment practice. And these parametric studies could actually need, uh, need 
uh, for uh, very complex models, very extended models, possibly considering also the variability of the seismic motion, because we are dealing with uh, structure which can be widely extended in, in plan and co covering also slopes which are, which are irregular. So I thank you very much for uh, inviting me, for uh, listening and, and for being here. So I'm happy okay. if you will have questions, if there is time, I don't know. Yes, there are some questions already. Thank you so much. Very interesting uh, presentation, exactly in the interests of our working group. Um, and uh, I think you conclude as you're thinking about the importance of give some guidelines for practical application. In my point of view, mainly for single build, if you want to study single buildings, insert in regular, irregular um, uh, aggregates because with regular, it seems that it is not so so problematic this this topic. So I opened the Q and and the A session. We have two two colleagues with Horizon. So Mario, Stefan, please. I think you were the first. You were the first one. Yes. Yeah. So thank you, Andrea, for your very clear, uh, thoughtful uh, and thought-provoking uh, uh, presentation. Uh, by the way, you were uh, exactly on time, and well, we would have liked to, to listen to you even more. But mm -hmm. I have one remark and one short question for you. One remark is the fact that uh, really uh, historical centers that, uh, of course, have, uh, are fundamental from cultural and uh, identity point of view, really are drain of uh, irregularity. And starting from the material, because Mesor itself is irregular material, but then looking at the uh, building aggregate. So, uh, my remark is the, is the fact that we, uh, at least as a working group, uh, this working group historically started uh, gathering people who were more interested, uh, let's say, to dynamical effect of irregularity. Basically, we were studying two degrees of freedom, one story uh, systems. Uh, and we're comparing the response with uh, the uh, uh, conventional single degree of freedom systems. Uh, then with time, uh, we were looking to, to more carefully to uh, real structures, but mostly we were uh, looking at reinforced concrete structures, okay? So, and the steel structures, but I think it's time that we really look uh, uh, carefully to uh, major structures as you were showing us and uh, we should also try to attract uh, people in our group that are uh, involved in uh, this type of studies. Uh, I have just one short question to you. You were showing uh, a comparison between uh, pushover analysis and uh, time history analysis at a certain point. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit more about that? Uh, this is my particular interest. Yeah, yeah, I can, uh, I can imagine that. Okay. Sorry. Even if it's a particular uh, question, but it's just. Uh, okay. Okay. This was. Yeah, when you were building. Yeah, exactly, exactly. That. Building. Yes, this one. This one, I guess. Yeah. No, 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 no. no. The other one. The, you ah, the one with the okay, the yeah, uh, showing some results. This one, or, okay, a bit further. I, okay, in the no, probably this one, eh? left side, left side. Okay, which over versus nonlinear time is so. If you can elaborate a little bit about well, okay, I have to say that this is a, a work performed at the University of Genova, so probably okay, I, I can give you. Okay, some details because uh, we are also involved in the same project and uh, I'm coordinating in that project, the, the part of measure structure. So I, I have to be informed, but uh, but details are um, uh, by Sergio Marcino and Serena Cattari mainly. Uh, 
in this case, um, the, 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 the framework of the project uses um, pushover analysis to uh, identify, um, say, displacement uh, limit states. So the, the capacity is, a, a, is uh, identified by, by pushover analysis. And then uh, time history analysis is used uh, for, um, uh, let's say, modeling uh, the demand of, uh, of the structures. Uh, there, there is uh, a group of uh, Professor Yerbolino in Naples who, who has the who has worked in, uh, in the selection of the records for different sites. In this case, the, the site is Catania. Um, and the building, this building was actually part of the old uh, Catania project. Um, we took advantage of all the um, uh, survey information, material properties that were gathered within uh, the Catania project. Um, the different uh, uh, plots in the, the curves uh, depend, depend the, 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 the black lines uh, refer to the pushover analysis, uh, in which uh, you can see that depending on the direction, if I'm not wrong, this is the, the y direction, so probably um, these, uh, these three uh, pushover uh, analysis, it's four actually, one, two, three, four. And uh, um, the, um, the different uh, response you see can be basically uh, marked when we have some degree of collaboration in between the, the units. So when the, um, the, the building uh, in red is able to move without involving uh, the others, then the, the the response tends more towards the uh, the one of the isolated building. Although the presence of uh, this uh, this green building with this connection through the um, the no tension trusses uh, is limiting the torsional response of the building as well. So this is uh, somehow guiding the the, the response and the same applies for the, the other in the other direction with the blue building uh, acting exactly in the same way it's a sort of track that the, the building has to uh, to follow so in the in this case uh, you see that uh, the uh, the buildings basically show a similar uh, capacity in terms of strength and this is also reflected uh, in the uh, dynamic uh, response, which is in this case an example of uh, one record for, this, for all the for all the structures. This directive behavior is not that uh, different, although some aspect due to the impact to the nonlinearity, say in the in the gaps, can be can be noticed. Thank you, Andrea. And then um, okay, the, the, it is not immediate moving from these uh, plots to the plot of the fragility curve because there is another step, which is the combination with the out of plane fragility that is, say, not reported here in this, uh, this plot. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. So, Professor Capus, Andreas Capus, please, Andrea. Yes. Um, well, first of all, I would like to congratulate um, Andrea. I remember him since he was a PhD student at the, during the last few uh, years, and it's good to see him, you know, deliver such an interesting uh, keynote lecture at, um, at an international um, uh, workshop. Uh, Andrea, I think you, you made it very clear, and um, you proved it in particular also with um, uh, through observation of uh, real buildings that there is an um, aggravating effect, there is an increase in vulnerability if you have the aggregate as opposed to the uh, individual buildings. What was less clear, at least to me, I might have missed something, is um, the effect of the position, of the relative position of the building in the aggregate. And to be very specific, it was, well, what, 30 years ago that we have shown uh, 
uh, we were the first ones to show it uh, for um, uh, adjacent buildings with different dynamic characteristics. It was meant uh, in general for buildings, but, and then it, we specialized it to concrete building. And it was clear that if you model this transfer of kinetic energy from the one end to the other end, including pounding and so on, there is clearly uh, an aggravating effect uh, at the end buildings. But we have also seen, and we were not the only ones, that uh, the intermediate buildings, on average, the behavior was better than if they were uh, isolated um, or single uh, buildings. So did you detect these trends in your own analysis, or this does not apply to the structures that you have seen? Thank you for, uh, first of all, for your uh, kind words, and then for, uh, for this uh, very interesting uh, question that uh, allows for some clarification that uh, um, uh, maybe it is needed. When, when we did this uh, simple analysis using uh, 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 raw building conglomerations and uh, uh, basically repetition of the same cell uh, along the, the units, we notice exactly what you are mentioning. So the, the improvement in the behavior of the uh, internal units and the aggregating conditions of the end units, both in the case of the longitudinal motion and the transverse motion for different reasons. So in the transverse motion, basically, we have a concentration of uh, uh, in-plane distortion, which can be critical, for instance, for world systems. And um, in, uh, in the head units, uh, we are also the, the, the possibility, as observed also in the reality, to have this kind of uh, local mechanisms, or let's say, as we, you were mentioning, the transfer for kinetic energy that is not uh, supported by another next theory, which is missing. Uh, this is actually uh, true. Uh, what we noticed that then uh, when we try to analyze an irregular aggregate, when we did this, uh, let's say, when you go to this, sorry. When you, when you consider the, this building, when we consider, for instance, the presence of a shorter building within a, uh, um, a linear aggregate, in, in this case, uh, uh, somehow the, the neighbor units are, in a, in a certain sense, end units as well, because because there is this uh, significant irregularity which concentrates uh, damage in, uh, in, this, uh, in this position. And you can see, for instance, in this case, that uh, the gaps opening in, uh, in this joint in between the central unit and the neighbor unit is much higher than the one in, uh, in the other joint. And the same uh, applies for these two other uh, joints. And also in terms of damage, when we have these weak connections and uh, we have a damage concentration in this internal unit, uh, and this is less evident in the case of the, the strong connection, although this irregularity is also, uh, let's say, uh, draining some damage in the internal units. Okay, thank you and keep up the good work. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. I think we need to go on. Uh, we are uh, a little bit late. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Tena Andrea. It was a well, pleasure to have you with us. It was very, very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, and with this, uh, we close this session and we move immediately to the next one, okay? So thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.